Well, welcome to Adventuring Academy Office Hours. Uh, my name is Brennan Lee Mulligan. I'm your humble dungeon master. Uh, so excited to have you all back in the chat. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Uh, this is uh, an extension of Adventuring Academy, a, a, a podcast about running tabletop games. And this is where we take a second uh, to sit down and take some questions from y'all uh, uh, out there in the chat and on our Discord and a couple other places where you can submit questions. Um, We'll try to answer as many questions as possible and also try to prioritize uh, the questions you guys are asking in chat. Uh, my good pal Kyle is going to be pulling questions from chat and sending them to me. So uh, feel free to put uh, any questions you have about running tabletop RPGs. Uh, without further ado, we are going to jump in and answer our first question here. This one comes from our Discord. We have our dropout Discord. Um, Sir Pengi! Thanks, Sir Pengi. Hello! Uh, uh, Sir Pengi, I'm well acquainted with you. Um, I'm not good at writing stories or coming up with plot points, but I do want to try DMing. Do you have any advice on how to come up with plot points to start a campaign? Uh, first of all, uh, don't don't be hard on yourself. Uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you are better at writing stories coming up with plot points than you think. Storytelling is second nature to human beings. Um, and it's one of those things that does actually really just get better with practice. The more you do it, um, you'll do well. On the flip side of that, I would also say that uh, don't demand that you be good at something that you're new at. Uh, I think sometimes people put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, my first adventure that I ran was historically bad. Uh, I've covered this on uh, the podcast before, and I, and I think uh, here on Office Hours before. My first game was quite bad. My friends told me it was bad while it was happening. Uh, uh, and I think that, you know, you have to find peace with, like, uh, stumbling through stuff and getting good at it. That being said, a lot of people I've heard anecdotally DM for the first time not when they're 10 years old and as such do a somewhat better job at it. So that could happen as well. Um, we're talking here about plot points and do you have any advice on how to come up with plot points specifically to start a campaign? This is a great question. We're going to talk a little bit uh, here about Treating your player characters like the main characters of a story, right? Now, let's look at two different examples of how heroes exist in media and how they are motivated to act, right? Um, there are some heroes that are uh, sort of reactive or passive, and there are other heroes that are very proactive and almost what we would call like revolutionary. Right? Um, you can work with both of those. I, the, the weird examples that are coming to my mind right now are if you think about uh, Luke Skywalker, the beginning of Star Wars, he's just hanging out on Tatooine, baby. He doesn't know that his dad is Darth Vader. Spoiler alert, for, you know, ha half a century old spoiler alert. Um, but what happens is that the big bad galaxy comes in and disturbs the normal status quo of Luke's life. This is very classic Joseph Campbell stuff about the call to adventure, the refusal of the call. You know, I'm not, I'm just a farm boy from Tattoo. How could I ever? And then lo and behold, uh, you are the chosen one and you, you have a big old adventure. Um, another example I'm going to pull is the reverse of that, where the desire to change and shake things up actually is inborn of the character. Now the desire to like change stuff is often something that we see with a lot of like anti-heroes or almost like villainous characters, which is a lot of why we think villains are so cool sometimes. It's because in a lot of classic mythical storytelling, the villains are disruptors, right? And the heroes are like, I was happy to be normal until you came and shook things up and now I'm gonna get you. Uh, but an example of a heroic character that is that uh, inborn motivation, that they are not having things thrust upon them. They're actually initiating it. it. Would probably be Jack Skellington from A Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a holiday time, so I'm kind of in that mood right now. Uh, everything's actually fine and normal, and no one's messing with Jack Skellington. He's just uh, depressed uh, and deals with that depression by, you know, uh, inadvertently discovering Christmas Town on a very long walk and then shaking everything up himself. So. Let's talk about the two things you need to be able to do. Uh, plot points for your two characters. Number one. A DM's work starts in character creation, right? Uh, there's this very common thing throughout the tabletop community I, where people, I'll say, like, I'm going to run a game for some people, and they'll be like, great, I got my character, I'll see you there. And I'll be like, what is this? It's very common. I know I'm in the minority here. 
But it's wild to me that you would be like, I've got a character that's just going to show up in whatever this adventure is. Uh, adventures and characters should be tailored to complement one another. Really, you know, if you sh if you show up with your edge lord, two handed, uh, you know, two two wielding weapons ranger, and I prepared an adventure for the Care Bears, we're going to have some cognitive dissonance here. There should have been some communication beforehand. So my hot take here is that character creation is a process that should be done hand in hand with the dungeon master and the player uh, who's playing the character. Um, so there's two things you should be doing at that uh, moment in time. Let's say that your characters do want more passive, classic, mythological heroes. Like, I'm just a badass. I don't really want to write an adventure for myself. I'm just a knight, period, right? A little more of a simple character. Your job, as your players come up with those characters, is to begin the session with why it's okay that they're passive, which often means what is it about the world that's working for them, right? When people are passive, it means that the status quo fundamentally props them up and it makes their life okay. Uh, so all you have to do is underline a couple of story beats where they love the world as it is. We see the hobbits in the Shire kind of liking the Shire, where right? we see Pip and Mary at the Green Dragon. Um, if your characters have not built a sort of strong, you know, Jack Skellington-esque motivation into themselves, that's fine. Why are things groovy for them and why aren't they motivated to be acting? Because if your players have made characters that are a little bit more passive and don't have a motivation to act, there's only one thing you can do, and that's destroy the things they love and the world that they've come to care about. Uh, that's right. If your characters are passive in the status quo, the only way to spur them to adventure is to disrupt that status quo. So as the DM, you got to spend a little bit of time laying out why they love the world as it is, what they're attached to, whether it be ideals, other characters, NPCs, setting elements, each other, whatever. Uh, and then you've got to come in and destroy that, maybe with a villain, maybe with antagonists, maybe with just an element of your world, right? Um, so you've got to disrupt passivity to spur them into action and let the motivation be, cool, now you're not passive anymore because I've disrupted what was allowing you to be passive in the first place. The secondary thing, this is a longer answer, but this is a great question, Sir Pengi, I really enjoy this. Uh, the other thing you can do is start a campaign uh, having created uh, proactive characters, where the characters have motivation. Um, this often feels really, really fun, especially if that motivation is something inborn and really intuitive and fun to play. Are these characters, uh, you know, you know, elves that are seeking their long lost homeland? Are they uh, adventurers that you know have per already have personal reasons for seeking out monsters and trying to slay them be it like lost loved ones uh, even something as simple as like we are mercenaries looking for gold you gotta g sort of go in and build the groundwork of well why did you choose dangerous adventuring mercenary work how hard up for gold are you and as a GM you can suggest things to your players like your characters are deeply in debt and you're in debt to dangerous people so this kind of life of being an adventurer is actually the safer option for you um, all of this boils down to your plot hooks to start an adventure should not be things that it feels like your players are obliged to do obligation is the death of and if your players feel obliged to do an adventure in character, because they're like, I guess this is the right thing to do, or even worse, if they feel obliged out of character, like, guys, I think Brennan's going to freak out if we don't go into this dungeon. Bad. Because they're not uh, having an immersive experience. So your job is to uh, create desire and motivation in the actual characters your players are carrying. And you can do that by... Uh, disrupting and harming the things they care about, or you can do that by making in the character creation process motivations for these players that will be intuitive, emotional, and resonant with the ability to immerse themselves in that character. Hopefully that makes sense. That's like writing advice mostly, but that's what the question was. Uh, awesome. I'm going to go look for some more questions. Um, Oh, this is a great one. Hey, Brandon, how do you reward creative play besides just giving advantage? Well, in 5e, D&D, advantage is a great way to reward creative play. Uh, it's a great way to tell someone they did a good job deciding what their move was going to be. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can reward creative play. 
Uh, I play in Dimension 20 with Allie Beardsley, and they are one of the most creative players uh, out there. And you'll often find that uh, Allie was the most recent addition to being a D&D player, and a lot of times that will spur creativity. Um, Matt Mercer has a great point where he talks about um, how familiarity with the game can sometimes create ruts where we stay within the rules and the confines. A uh, little spoiler for the Unsleeping City here in an earlier episode. Uh, uh, Allie Beardsley, in a pitched combat, had their character Pete the Plug cast Detect Thoughts on a non-combatant character. And their reason for doing so in-game was so prescient and point, or I guess poignant is the word I mean to use, was so poignant and moving that as a DM, you have to go, this is a better story, so we're going to reward this mechanically. And I think as a DM, your players never know how congealed the world is. By which I mean, if a player does something and it is so damn cool and it's better than what you wrote, you have to do a little uh, sort of appraisal in your head at that moment and go, I know that I had a plan for what this was going to be, but have I actually revealed any of that plan? Like, have the players actually seen or encountered this part of the world that I designed? And if the answer is no, an opportunity has been presented to you to rewrite your world to some degree to accommodate the newer, cooler thing, right? Uh, now, you have to do this sparingly, because you don't necessarily want to be constantly rewriting your own world on the fly. But especially when it comes to things like lore or the nature of magic, you know, like cosmological details rather than like plot or character motivation details, I think I'm, I'm usually less likely to change character motivations on the fly because so much of a character's motivation is subtext anyway. But lore elements, if someone does something and I go, wow, It'd be really cool if they cast, you know, they cast detect thoughts on this sphinx in this tomb. I didn't plan for that stone sphinx to be an actual petrified sphinx, but if it had been, wouldn't this scene be awesome? There's a certain degree of that which you're allowed to do as the game master. Um, great. Uh, you manage to easily disguise moments of improv, effortlessly making on-the-spot decisions that seem entirely planned. This is a very uh, complimentary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Arthur Egfort's, uh, oh, that's a spoiler for the second episode of season one. Uh, uh, how do you do it? Um, well, first of all, I'll give you guys like an actual answer, which is improv classes. Um, that's a really expensive answer, and that's not the most accessible thing for people that don't live in a town that has like an improv center, but it is a very practical piece of advice. You can get better at improv. Um, uh, you can also get better at improv by, you know, reading books on the subject if you're not, a, if you don't have a theater available to you. Uh, there's also a channel called NY Comedy. There's a couple of YouTube channels that have actual improv performances on them, and you can kind of see how people are doing what they're doing. Um, in terms of disguising moments of improv, which is like a separate skill, right? Um, what I would say is, this is not something that everyone agrees with me on. I actually was in a, a, a debate with my good buddy Taylor Moore, who uh, runs uh, Fortunate Horse, which is a fun podcast network. They have a, a fun D&D podcast called Rude Tales of Magic, uh, which you guys should go and check out. Um, uh, the maybe we're having was Taylor was insisting like no the stuff that a dungeon master decides in their preparation you know is is somehow more significant than the stuff improvised at the table which is where you get you can feel that point of view when people are like did you plan that or did you you know come up with that was that supposed to happen this dichotomy is, I think, largely false on like a philosophical level, right? Because if I made something up on Monday and I put it in like a piece of graph paper or wrote it on an index card when I was session prepping, or I made it up right now at the table while you're talking to me, how does the authorial purpose of that really change? Or, or I guess how does the authority of, like, I made it up and the things I make up in this world uh, happen, for lack of a better word. 
So what's the difference in making if I made it up on Monday or I made it up right now? And I think you should give yourself that permission. You are no less of an author of your campaign world at the table than you were you know, Friday on your couch with some snacks doing your prep work for the session. So like, allow yourself to feel the same degree of authority you do extemporaneously as you do in those preparatory moments. Um, uh, do you have a set plan for creating a storyline that includes all of your characters? What do you do if someone leaves in the middle of a campaign? How do you explain a PC absence to the other PCs? Um, I want to DM for my sister and create a campaign of my own, but I don't know where to start. Do I start with the world or the plot or write them both at the same time? This might be three separate questions that I've asked all at once, but uh, I, I will, uh, so I'll take them all differently. Do you have a set plan for creating a storyline that includes all of your characters? No, there is no set plan. Uh, there is a loose plan, and it should be kept loose because that's how you leave a world that can incorporate and honor the decisions of your PCs. A GM's or DM's world is second priority to the actions uh, and storylines of your player characters. That is law. Um, what do you do if someone leaves in the middle of a campaign? How do you explain a PC out to their PCs? This is a great question. And this is some stuff, you know, sometimes I get questions where you have to be like, <laughs> theory, feelings. There's actual practical advice to give here. What do you do if someone leaves in the middle of a campaign? How do you explain a PC out to the PCs? There's a couple options. All of them have pros and cons. The first option, if you can get enough time and planning, which is my preferred one, is the character also leaves for the amount of time the player will be absent and a, an in-world justification is given for that character's absence. That honestly always feels the best because it doesn't strain any suspension of disbelief within the game world. Um, and you're not, I guess, like foisting anything on people that they don't want to do. Uh, the other options are turning that character into an NPC where they're just kind of like t tagging along. Um, and that's okay, but, th but that character stops to feel as real, right? Because a DM has more priorities than playing a character exactly as they would be played. And then you also always feel weird playing with something that belongs to someone else. Like, do I really want to make that decision for that character? So when PCs are played by dungeon masters, they always tend to be a little bit like in reserve, right? Um, uh, so I would say, and the, the third thing is to like, uh, you know, give that PC over to another player character, which is a lot of the same issues that giving them over to the DM does. Uh, or you can postpone the session, but that honestly sucks for a lot of reasons as well. You know, people getting a schedule together is really, really hard. Um, so I would say the best thing is if you can create in-game justifications for why the character is absent, right? Um, also, if you're planning a campaign where people will often be absent, you might look into doing a West Marches style campaign. Um, uh, for those who don't know what that is, a West Marches style is one where the PC, th there's a roster of PCs that's sort of revolving doors in and out, and it's structured to allow for a lot of absences, basically. Uh, I want to DM for my sister and create a campaign of my own, but I don't know where to start. Do I start with the world or the plot or write them both at the same time? Um, I would say uh, start at your point of inspiration, which I know sounds like a cop-out, but um, I think that you should have both these. Also, I don't know that these are different, right? Worlds exist fourth dimensionally. Time moves forward in a given setting. Plot is just a word we have for like the sequence of events that are the focus of a story. But in any world, things change and progress. So there are stories happening whether or not you're focusing on them. So I think that start with both might be the most accurate answer. Because as you create a world, you're creating characters. As you're creating characters, those characters have thoughts, feelings, goals, wants, and desires. Those goals, wants, and desires produce plot. And if you start with plot, you're going to do the exact same process in reverse. Things are happening? Cool. Who's doing those things? Oh, the people are doing those things are in a place? What's that place like? I think that uh, the dichotomy between character and plot is illusory. They are one and the same. Um, very cool. Uh, this is going to be our last one, gang. Sorry, we, we uh, are running a little low on time today. Sarah uh, Bilger. I'm going to say Bilger. It could be Bilger. If it's Bilger, I'm so sorry. But I said Bilger, I'm going to stand by it. 
I want to DM for my sister and create a campaign of my own. Oh, that's the same question. Ha ha! Sarah, I already answered your question. Uh, this one's from Sangavi Chandran. Uh, are you ever scared of burnout from running so many elaborate campaigns? No. I'm not scared of burnout. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, I'm really not. Um, I Making up worlds uh, slaps, and I fucking love it. And uh, that's all I got to say about that. Hell yeah. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. We'll do another one of these soon. Thank you for being in the chat and for all your awesome questions. Best of luck with your home games out there. This has been Adventuring Academy Office Hours. I'm Brindley Mulligan. We'll see you guys next time.